All right, welcome everyone. My name is Kurt. I am a comic book colorist. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, in the video today, I want to talk about color palettes. Uh, it's something that I think a lot of people are confused about based on the questions that I get and the messages I get and uh, questions on the Discord and, and various things. And I haven't really talked about it a lot on this channel, and so I want to spend some time in this video kind of explaining you know, how I think through color palettes, how I use it, how to actually create them and, and use them on a page. And uh, before I go into all that, uh, I want to thank uh, Evan Carruthers. This is, uh, he was a writer on this project, uh, and the artist was, uh, I believe it's uh, Yezriel Rojales. I hope I'm not butchering that name, uh, but it's for a project called the, Ign the Ignis Quadrant. So um, I'll put some links below for you guys to check this out. But, um, but thanks for them for letting me make this video uh, using it. So early on in the process, I think there's a, a, a step that kind of gets skipped, I think, or especially when you're a beginner, when you get, you get a page in and the first thing you do is, okay, I'm going to do the band this color and the hat this color. And, you know, instead of thinking about the overall picture of the entire page. Now, with this is a cover, okay, and covers are, are kind of unique because, you know, they have to stand out on a shelf against everything else. You know, there, there's things that you'll do on a cover to make it stand out that you may or may not do, like on an interior page. That's because when you're looking at this on a shelf, you know, 10 feet away, you still want it to be able to be eye-catching and, and, and grab people and that kind of thing. Early on in this one, there was, uh, you can see in the line art, I mean, obviously we have our, our cowboy guy here, uh, this character in the middle. We've got lots of empty space kind of around him to help kind of frame him up, which we want to maintain. And then we've got this background here. But but in its simplest form, this is sort of, and this is the part that I think kind of gets forgotten a lot, is if we really break this down into its most basic shapes, okay, you have, you know, a big kind of dark shape up here uh, with some guys back here in the background. That is all framing, you know, this guy that we're seeing here. And then we've got, you know, these areas here that are, that are a little bit simpler with our shadows from our bad guys here. Getting those shapes to read is your first job. Now, on this one, I've got a really strong complementary color palette, okay? When you're looking at colors on the color wheel, uh, and I think I've got one here somewhere. There we go. Um, colors that are far apart on the wheel are going to have, that's the maximum amount of contrast you can have when it comes to the hues themselves, okay? As far as the greens, the blues, the reds, whatever. We're talking about hue. Um, opposite, you have, it's kind of like a speedometer, okay? If they're close together, then they're gonna have less contrast, okay? Like the dark greens into the light greens into the yellows, that kind of analogous palette there, you know? That is a smaller amount of contrast, but as you widen that and you're picking colors that are far, far apart, that is the maximum amount of contrast. So that's why complementary color palettes are so common. That's why you see all the movie posters and the memes about blue and orange. Like, it works. <laughs> like, the, it mathematically works. So, so with this one, now this was never a step in the process that I, like, actually did. Okay, there was, there was no point when I show you guys the time lapse for this in a second, we'll walk through all that. At no point did it look like this, okay? But in my head, I'm imagining that I've got this warm shape surrounded by a big blue shape. That's it, okay? Like, that's the big shapes on this that need to read. Now, within those shapes, you know, there's more to do, and we can talk about that. I wanted this to read, even if there was no detail in it at all. We've got an orange thing in the middle of a, a lot more blue. That's it. That's the big picture, right? This is the part when we talk about actually digging into adding more colors. I think that's what confuses a lot of people when it comes to color palettes. Think about it this way instead. So in this orange area overall, let's forget the blue for a second and just look at the orange. If we go back and look at the final colors on this, what do you see in this shape? Okay. If I want this shape to on average be orange, okay, or at least very warm, what are the colors that you're seeing there, okay? You're seeing yellows, you're seeing reds, you're seeing browns, you know, skin tones are warm, the table's warm, the bottles are warm. All of it is warm, okay? Which means that if we get into this orange shape and look at it again by itself, we're talking about this shape here, our main palette overall is a complementary palette, the blue and orange. But when we get into the orange, 
what is this? This is its own palette, right? It's the other palette everybody talks about. It's an analogous palette, okay? It is, uh, where's my pen tool? It's yellows. Why can't I draw? We've got yellows. We've got oranges. We've got deeper oranges. We've got reds. I mean, these shadows in here are getting into this area. But what is this? This is just an analogous palette, okay? So if you start thinking about it that way, it becomes a lot easier. It's like, yes, my overall palette is complementary. But within the orange area that I have here, we've got this palette, okay? Now, what's outside of that palette, okay? If we bring this down, uh, let's get this out of the way down here and look at the rest of it. What do we have in the rest of it? It's another analogous palette. <laughs> it's just blue this time. All the colors here fall into these categories. We got blues. I don't know if there's any purple. I guess what's outside here is a little bit warmer. But everything we're looking at in the background is in this range of the color picker. So it's like we have two different analogous color palettes that work together to create a complementary palette. And the colors are much easier to choose if you think about it that way up front. It's like, I know when I get on this guy, I'm not going to throw around a bunch of cool colors if I want him to overall, on average, be warm, okay? Because at the end of the day, I want these shapes to be readable. Even if I zoom way out, you can still see that sense of, obviously, there's warm in the middle and blue around him. I don't think many people appreciate how much easier this makes it to choose your colors. <laughs> because, and I know that's something else you guys think about a lot, is how do you choose your colors? It's a tough question, but this helps to narrow that down. Because I'm limited in this area to that warm area of the color picker. I'm limit or the color wheel. You know, I'm limited back here to the colors that are just cool. Um, there's other ways I'm limiting it with value and saturation and all that as well. But the big lesson I want you to take away from this is just because you say something is a complementary color palette, it doesn't mean you have to think in terms of just that blue and orange everywhere because it gets kind of confusing. So make it easier for yourself. Through process of elimination, I've eliminated a lot of options by having a plan. Just like you plan your values, you plan your hues, all those things. So having a plan up front, it makes your color choices easier. You don't have 16.7 million options over here when you limit your options based on the big shapes of that image that you want people to see, that you want to read. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, leave a comment below and I'll try to answer it. So I'm about to start the time lapse on this one and we'll talk through all of that. But I want you guys to notice as you're watching this, that throughout this process, I am going to be reinforcing this idea throughout the entire time. Are things going to get lighter? Sure. Are they going to get darker? We're going to have shadows, all this stuff. But the whole time in my head, I'm seeing this. And I want to make sure that I maintain my big complementary scheme, that I've got my warms and my cools. And that's how this one came together. So let's start the time lapse. All right, so now we're in the time lapse. I colored this in Clip Studio Paint. And uh, you'll see right from the beginning, I'm trying to set up uh, the background first. And once I've established that, we'll get on to the character. But I'm going to be choosing all of those cool colors, just like we talked about earlier, to reinforce that idea of the background is cool, the foreground is warm. Now, they're not always going to be this simple. This is just how you know I did it for this page. But I find this applies in a lot of cases. So, um, But I'm going through and I'm just adjusting the colors from this one color they all are right now. Um, I found it easier to kind of slide the colors into where I want them. And it, and it brings them closer together uh, palette-wise because you know I don't have to just randomly pick you know a color for this bottle i'm using what's there and adjusting it based on that you know so if i want the bottle to seem a little green i'm going to push it toward that green but i'm not necessarily going to make it green you know or if i want um, you know uh, the label of this bottle to be lighter i'm just making it lighter first and then deciding you know where the hue is keeping in mind that I want this to all be pretty warm here in the front. I did slow down this time lapse quite a bit. This one's only, I think, at maybe double speed, and I just cut out all the time that I was um, rambling while we were 
recording this on, on YouTube. And you'll notice here, the there's not a lot of changes in value here. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm keeping the contrast relatively low. This is not a, a hugely important area of the image, all these little bottles and things. So I'm not going to throw around like really brights and really darks in a place that is really not that important to the image. Um, anytime you have large, big differences between your lights and shadows, if they're right next to each other, it's going to draw a lot of attention, or just your darks and lights in general. So you can see me making the adjustments of those colors that are there, but I'm keeping them all in that same family. You know, I make the chair a little bit darker, make the table a little bit bluer. You know, all these things help to keep it uh, consistent. The one thing um, in the front section that I really didn't do that warm was the chair. Uh, and you're seeing that now. It's actually pretty gray. It, it's really not that warm or that cool relative to everything else. Um, but even that is contrast. You know, if it's the only thing that gray on the image, it's also going to help stand it out. But if he was going to be warm, then I didn't want warm right next to his head. Like that would kind of weaken, you know, the focus on his head. So by cooling that off and making it less saturated, then you've got the contrast of the warm on his face against the, the relatively cool on his uh, on his chair there. And and the, the warm, cool palette here wasn't, you know, an accident, obviously. Like, this character actually had uh, a lot of warm colors on him. So that helped me, you know, decide on, well, if he's all warm colors anyway, let's just lean into that. And that way we don't have to, you know, do a bunch of other crazy colors uh, that, that, you know, don't show up in the book. So... Uh, that all kind of factored into my decision to make this a, you know, a warm palette. Uh, I am using a keyboard shortcut to pull up this hue saturation uh, lightness slider uh, or the box to adjust that. Uh, I, I keep it. Uh, I keep all of my shortcuts on the left hand on the on the keyboard, the left hand side, without really ever having to move it. And so I have a, a shortcut that opens up that window, and that's why you just see it pop up. I'm not actually clicking anything to make it show up. I'm using a keyboard shortcut. Even the process of sliding these things around to choose these colors, there is kind of an order of operations, <laughs> I guess you could call it if it was math. Um, I'm almost always first figuring out, is it lighter or darker relative to what's around it? Does it need to be lighter or darker? That's the first thing. Um, saturation usually comes probably after that. Um, once I've got you know the, uh, the value chosen, uh, and then from there, figuring out what the actual color is. But even with that, you know, if I want it to be green, I'm just pushing it toward green. You know, if I want it to be blue, I'm pushing it toward blue. But I'm uh, I'm not just going and finding blue and sticking it on there. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, at least that's how I work. Uh, starting the rendering on this now. Um, again, reinforcing that blue background, warm foreground. Now, in this section, you know, obviously, you know, I'm going to put a lot of lights on his uh, face and, and on his helmet. You know, we've got these strong shadows casting toward him. And so if I knew his his helmet, his helmet, his hat was going to be very bright, I needed what was around it to be darker. And so that's why you're seeing me lay in those shadows behind him and kind of keeping that relatively dark behind him so that it's got something to play off of. Because if... Um, you know, you can't have something stand out because it's light if it's surrounded by more light. <laughs> it's just not really that possible. It's going to all blend together. So um, every color chosen is is chosen in the context of what's around it every single time. Uh, with this, you can see I'm just using the lasso here to uh, choose the areas where all the lights are going to go. Uh, if you have questions about how I'm actually doing this all technically without switching layers then uh, and shrinking that selection and all that stuff, uh, be sure to watch the video on that. I'll link it below. But I was using a brush uh, by uh, a guy named Frendon. You guys know I don't really make my own brushes if you've been around this channel very much. But um, uh, there's a, a, a guy named Frendon that makes a, a... He's got a big mega pack of brushes. And uh, this was one of the brushes in that. It's got a little bit of texture to it. I like the way that it looked. It felt like the right feel <laughs> for, for this particular piece. And uh, all the lights that you're seeing me uh, use on this are all you know roughly in the same ballpark, kind of that warm yellow color. 
But uh, you will see me, like I am now, go in and kind of, sometimes I'll desaturate it, sometimes I might shift it to a different color, um, just to make sure that the light doesn't, I don't necessarily want it to just look yellow everywhere, you know. Uh, and so you'll see me kind of adjust that every now and then. And sometimes it takes a couple of tries to actually get the right color. So you see me, you see me trying that too. I'm not immune to trying to get the right color sometimes. I don't always pick the right one right off the bat. There's there's a few subtle little washes on this. They're they're kind of hard to see, but I am I am using those as as the primary shadows on this and uh, kind of working around those. Someone during the stream was asking uh, about how I choose light sources. Uh, with this one, it was really obvious as far as where the light source was because we had these big cast shadows, you know, coming up from the bottom. So that pretty much dictates uh, dic dictates. I can't. <laughs> That pretty much dictates where your light's going to come from. But uh, if you don't have that, I, I tend to try with, you know, whatever's most dramatic uh, that works within the, the, the context of the scene for the most part. But uh, even at this point, so we're like halfway through the time lapse at this point, um, you can still see that big orange shape. You can see that big blue shape. You know, on average, we're still, we're still where we want to be there. But as long as those big shapes read, you know, everything else is just kind of dressing it up. I mean, adding detail, adding a few highlights and things like that just helps reinforce what's there. What I did here, I was using a hard light layer uh, to render uh, that on, and I just doubled it. Like, it, what I was doing was too subtle, so I just duplicated that layer, and it kind of intensified everything. And then I think I turned the opacity of that new copy down a little bit, so it wasn't quite as intense, but... Sometimes if my colors aren't intense enough, just duplicating a, that layer will actually get the effect that I want. Uh, and also it, it was intentional to keep the gun kind of on the cool side uh, and, and the relative to what's around it, it kind of sticks out. Because it's not very big on the page, but I think it's important for this scene. I'm still just lighting all the, you know, his uh, paraphernalia there on the table with that yellow color. Sorry, I don't know what all, I don't always know what to talk about on these things. Um, I wanted to uh, intensify that blue just around his head, and again, that kind of helps frame that orange on his on his uh, on his hat. So uh, I basically lit the bottom of the of the walls as if there was some bounce light coming off the floor into the walls, and it was. Um, I don't know if that is a realistic color blue, but it, it looked cool, so we went with it. <laughs> um, at this stage, I am painting in some really subtle shadows. I would almost call this more of like a uh, like an ambient occlusion, if you're familiar with that term. It, it's just uh, all the little uh, corners and edges and nooks and crannies where light doesn't really... Um, get into very much and so um, it's just a way to increase the contrast increase the detail I really only did this on him uh, there really wasn't much else on the page I thought needed it it's very subtle but it, it, it looks cool when it's done and uh, here I'm starting to add a little bit of uh, kind of reflected light into the shadows um, the primary light source on this guy is you know, this big yellow light so in all the shadows from that you would get all the secondary light sources that are not as bright. So um, the environment itself is kind of this blue color, so that's why you're seeing me kind of throw that color around here in the shadows. And it 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 is it's subtle. It, it's not you know really super intense blue or anything, but it's just enough to kind of make him feel, you know, like he's part of the environment. Or at least that was my goal anyway. <laughs> Oh, here I'm going in and just intensifying some of those colors, increasing the saturation, making his vest more yellow, making his bandana more red. They were kind of a, coming out a little muted. And I'm just adding in a little bit more of that warmth, um, light bouncing around off his helmet would... How do I keep saying helmet? His hat uh, would reflect and bounce around in there and keep getting more and more saturated. And so you see it getting a little bit warmer there. But by keeping all of the rendering on a separate layer above my base colors, I can go under the rendering like I've done here, and I'm changing his the color of his pants without having to actually re-render anything. I, I put a new overlay layer on top of everything. Uh, again, he just looked a little muted. The colors just felt a little dead. And so um, I went in and selected him minus the shadows. 
So the shadows stayed cool, and that brightened him up quite a bit. Levels adjustment to brighten it up even more. And then I put like a photo filter on it at the end, just to score. I think it, uh, it was one of those color lookup LUT files in Photoshop, just kind of a warming, intensifying type effect. And I didn't use it everywhere. Uh, you see me painting it out of, of some of the areas on a mask there. Other than that, everything else from here on out is, I think, just basically small details. But um, I hope this has been helpful for you guys. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, what's happening now, I'm just, I'm on a normal layer on top, just adding some details and a few little highlights and things, uh, to make sure that, uh, there's a little more detail on him, you know, relative to everything else, or a lot more on him relative to everything else. But, uh, if you enjoy this content want to help support it, uh, consider clicking some of the links in the description, uh, Patreon, I've got courses, I got a new course on Coloring with Clip Studio, if you haven't checked that out yet. I do a live class every month for patrons. We've added quite a few lately. Thanks to everybody that signed up. And uh, I do fee uh, feedback for them and do critiques every month uh, for all the work that they post in my uh, Discord, which is one of the perks there. So again, thank you for watching. I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.